Hi to everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Raul Kekswan, Associate Professor of Pharmacology, JIPMA. Uh, in this session, uh, we're going to discuss about the pharmacogenetic markers in printing the phenytoin neurotoxicity in person with epilepsy. Let's move on to the introduction. The epilepsy is the common neurological disorder that has to take, and anti epilepsy drugs are the mainstay of the treatment. And if, if, if you see this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very few drugs were available uh, in the last few years, but now we can see that there are a lot of uh, new drugs has been uh, approved. Okay, but in spite of the availability of this all these old generation, new generation drugs, we are facing the challenges in the treatment of epilepsy. There are three challenges. I have uh, I have shown here in the slide. You can see that. Uh, uh, you can see that despite the optimal uh, antibiotic treatment, one third of the patients are drug uh, refractory. That uh, means they are not uh, uh, responding to the uh, drug therapy. Another is uh, the predicting the optimum dose is a time-consuming process, and currently we are practicing the trial and error method. And third is uh, the very important one is that uh, it's difficult to predict which patient likely to develop the adverse effects. Uh, so some of the adverse effects are very serious like scar, the serious, the serious kidneys, adverse reactions like a, a Stephen Charles syndrome and a toxic epidermal uh, necrosis. So now we're going to concentrate on the, how to predict this toxicity in anti epileptic drugs. So the drug chosen for this today's session about the, the phenytoin. Phenytoin is, uh, you know, uh, despite the, the new new drugs, uh, you know, the phenytoin is a commonly prescribed uh, uh, anti epileptic uh, drug for its advantages being it is highly uh, effective and also inexpensive and non selective. But this drug has a limitation as we have already seen about the the limitation, like uh, you know, fixing the starting dose of phenytoin, uh, it's a time consuming, you're doing by trial and error method. Okay, and uh, another thing is about the toxicity profile, it can cause acute toxicity and the chronic toxicity. Okay, and um, uh, uh, especially this uh, neurotoxicity is uh, commonly seen when the plasma concentration are high. So the most of the patient will see, but there are, there are a few people also uh, uh, develop the serious epidemic adverse reaction, which is highly fatal. So we're going to discuss much about this neurotoxicity and this epidemic toxicity in the coming slide. So as you all know that at the given uh, standard dose of phenytoin, there is a mock individual variation in the plasma phenytoin level. And then the, you all, we all know that this uh, for the saturable nonlinear uh, kinetics, uh, meaning to say that the minor increase in the dose uh, that uh, that makes the patient to attain the higher toxic concentration that leads to phenytoin toxicity. And moreover, this drug is walking the this drug is walking the narrow therapeutic range of 10 to 20 uh, microgram per uh, uh, ml. So, so, so there are a lot of factors can predispose to phenytoin toxicity. Over the period of uh, uh, years, we have identified many factors like uh, those having hepatic dysfunction, those having kidney failure, those having taking uh, you know, concomitant enzyme inhibitors, drugs, okay, and those having hypoalbinia, they may develop the phenytoin toxicity. So, so any, anyone having this factor definitely going to develop. But there are few patients, uh, okay, even the absence of these factors, they may develop the uh, phenytoin toxicity. That leads to the speculation of the genetic factors which can cause uh, uh, phenytoin toxicity. So the uh, the types of the human genome project, uh, the, which kickstarted this uh, the pharmacogenetics. Uh, so where the pharmacogenetics generally deals with uh, how the, the genetic variation uh, in a single gene or few related genes affect the drug efficacy or toxicity. So uh, okay, so general whenever it deals with the pharmacogenetics, it's uh, talk of uh, maybe the, that uh, uh, the focus will be on the uh, few genes or the single gene. Whereas uh, the pharmacogenetics, on the other hand, it, it will uh, you know uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a whole genome approach uh, to cover the uh, multi, uh, multiple variants. Okay, so the one important point we need to see that the uh, we need to note that in the conventional clinical trial. The genetic variability of the study participants are largely ignored because the, uh, that genetic variability causes a lot of changes. So the, if you look at the uh, conventional drug discovery approach, that is we call as a one size fit for all. It's like a ready made uh, shape concepts where you know the uh, the designer or kind of bring up the source. And uh, he expect that who are uh, uh, 
the, the, the customer who have this particular size now will fit. That is uh, uh, the concept. Similarly, uh, in the, the case of BCLA, you put these uh, pharma, uh, pharma or clinical trials where they conducted a trial okay and bring out their molecule okay the suit is not but the molecule here okay i uh that molecule and uh, uh, we are assuming that uh, the, the genetic profile of the participants are constant or the similar okay but in reality we all know that uh, you know we, we are all different genetically uh, and uh, some are uh, oversized some are undersized so the suits one size uh, will not fit for all and uh, as a result the size need to be altered uh, okay, according to the uh, persons, we need to tailor it according to the persons. That similarly, the drug dose also for some individuals need to be increased or the dose has to be uh, decreased. So the generally, you, are, you can see the different groups of drugs here. Okay, and if you look at the present, present scenario of this drug therapy, what you listed here, you can see here. So what is the expected? Okay, uh, after the clinical trials, we expect this drug should work under percentage. Uh, you can produce 100 percent clinical response in the patient population but in reality you can see that uh, the non responders uh, to this drug therapy is uh, uh, pretty high uh, okay and on top of it you can see that uh, the areas okay the adverse drug reaction okay uh, there is a one lakh patient die every year uh, due to the adverse drug reaction and uh, it is a sixth leading cause of death so all because we ignore this the, the genetic variability and the drug which are uh, the, the main uh, the, the area we have focus on the anti epileptic drugs as i mentioned before one third of the patients are, are refracted to the drug treatment so the, this all leaves uh, gives uh, an understanding about there is a huge variability in drug response Okay, that variability need to address. So, how, so whenever the variability in drug response comes, we need to look at the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile. So that's what we are seeing that in kinetic drug metabolizing and drug transporters. Uh, so kinetics of uh, pharmacodynamic is a drug top and proteins like receptors. So we need to look, examine or sequence these genes. Uh, to identify the reasons why there is a variability in the efficacy and the toxicity. So uh, that study the, of this genetic variability, okay, in the reference to toxicity or efficacy, that's what we call as a, a pharmacogenomics here. So the drug the, uh, chosen for this session is about the phenotype. Let's look at the pharmacokinetic and dynamic profile. Once the drugs uh, uh, you know, enter the small it is absorbed, and for that, the peak factor of protein play an important role. And once it comes to the liver for uh, uh, you know, metabolism, and uh, the one of the uh, chief enzymes which metabolize this uh, phenotoin is the cytochrome p 452 c 9 enzyme, which contribute to the 90 percentage of metabolism to the small extent, uh, co 2 c 19 plays a role. Okay, and once it is uh, 2C9 metabolized, leaves a uh, metabolite called 5 hydroxyphenyl heritoin. It is an uh, uh, inactive uh, water soluble metabolite that will be excreted out of, of the body. So, once it comes to the uh, blood circulation, you can see that uh, uh, it's bind to the uh, plasma or the main, and the free tract is able to uh, 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 you know, cross uh, the, uh, the brain and binds to the uh, sodium channel where it. Uh, uh, produces the target action by acting on the sodium channel. So, uh, so now uh, the most of the research went down to the drug toxicity. What they are seeing that they are focusing on is drug metabolizing enzymes, uh, and in particular they are focusing on this cvp 2 c 9 because you all know that it's a uh, contribute to 90 percent of metabolism. And uh, so they started seeing that this 2C9 enzymes and uh, to see the variant anything is present or not. Consider yourself in this picture, uh, okay? So we have a 2C9 genes, okay, it is present in the one of the copy of our 23 uh, pairs of chromosomes, and it is located in the uh, chromosome number 10, and we have two copies of the 2C9 genes that will be present, okay? So the exact location is uh, uh, in the QM24.2, this is the exact location of this uh, 2C9 gene. And uh, in, in particular, we are interested in the nucleoid position of 413 exon 3, where we want to see what allele is present. Okay, when I when we, when we, when we are analyzing a single gene, uh, a single gene, okay, that particular nucleotide we call as an allele. So this is the interested allele, whether the spot allele is present. And, uh, in normal uh, sense, we have the C allele is present. And we also see we have another copy of the gene what we obtained from the uh, maternal, okay. So that also we need to see what 
what allele is present is present in. So when call, when we analyze about the single copy of the gene, we call it as an allele. And this set uh, alleles will combine together and form the genotype. So if you look at the genotype, here is the star one, star one. CIP, CIP, uh, according to the allele nomenclature committee, star one, star one means that and the 430th position. Okay, this is C allele is present. This is a wild type or normal one that we call as star one. So star one refer to the the, the, the normal uh, no, normal nuclear type. Okay, or normal allele. Okay. So uh, because, uh, you can see that this amino acid, what it produces is arginine. Since both the pairs, the C is the C G C codes for arginine. Okay, uh, and the, both the copies are there. So arginine, arginine at the position one forty four in the protein. So the, the transcript and translate of the protein, and both are the same amino acids. But the problem is comes where, where there is you can see that the C replaced by T. Okay, that's nucleotide. So the four forty four thirty C replaced by T. Uh, you know, uh, this is the single nucleotide polymorphism. Okay, so in the since there is, uh, you can see that it is uh, replacing the uh, the paternal copy of the thing, uh, paternal copy of the gene. Okay, whereas in the maternal copy, uh, you know, it is still is a normal allele expression. So that means that genotype will be side two side two C9 star one star two. That means one copy C, another copy is T. So whenever there's a change in variant, we give the uh, uh, numbering. So the C to T at fourth position, uh, when it's happening, uh, then we have to give uh, star two position. If it happened in the one place, you know, so since we are, another place is a normal allele, we have to give star one, star two. Uh, otherwise, it's C by T. Okay. So in other, uh, in, 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 in an extreme situation, uh, you know, a uh, few people may have the, the this variant allele. This variant allele is the T. So the both the copies of paternal and maternal. Okay. The variant allele will, uh, 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 if, if it's inherent, then the genotype. Uh, will be uh, star to star to. But if you now we look at the uh, amino acids, the amino acids are uh, totally different because of this uh, you know, uh, uh, polymorphism leads to the change in the amino acids. Okay, and because of the change in the amino acid, the functionality of these enzymes, so the cyp 2 c enzymes will alter. Okay, and uh, in this one, we are also interested on the uh, other one more variant that is uh, the position. Uh, nuclear deposition uh, uh, 1075, uh, you know, that is a A replaced by C. So that variant, uh, whenever the A replaced P at this position, we have to give the designation star 3. So whenever there is A is available in the both the copies of the gene, then it is a star 1, star 2. And if there is one uh, one copy, uh, uh, you know, the, the variant that is present, then it is a star 1, star 3. And the both the copy is carrying the uh, you know the variant array, then it is a star three, star three. So, so what I would like to say is that if you have, if I, if your genotype results for this two variant is star one, star means your activity score is two. That means you carry the two normal functionality. That means it does it the function of the enzymatic property. That means it will be going to metabolize the drug properly. Okay, so that is why uh, that group we call as the extensive metabolizer. So those carrying the star one, star one, because it's going to metabolize, it's subscribed and whatever the so the two cyanide metabolize several drugs, not only peritone, uh, different drugs it can metabolize. But you can see that when there is a carrying a variant, okay, the activity score is gradually decreasing. You can see that uh, the the poor metabolizer group uh, that is the star two, star three, some person may carry the both the variant. Or uh, something that you carry in star three study in the both of these, then the the function the functional is zero. That means that uh, that the particular enzyme is not going to work for you. That means it is not going to uh, metabolize the drug. So in such cases, we call as a slow metabolizer or poor metabolizer. Okay, those carrying this uh, both the copies of star three, star three or star two, star three. So they're going to decrease the metabolism of the substrate like peritoin, phosphorin, and all. That leads to uh, toxin and most of the uh, drugs is metabolized or nanotherapeutic drugs like beta and water. So it's going to cause a uh, toxicity. So so our candidate genes, what we identified here is the 2C9 gene and that's for, for the enzyme and the variant we are interested in are the two variant, one is star two and star three, and these are the possible genotypes you make it. So uh, some of you uh, sitting here uh, observing this session, uh, we, we may have this, any of these possible uh, variant uh, uh, genotype uh, as far as star two or star three you have. But in the both side, if you are carrying the uh, uh, you know normal allele, 
then your the genotype will be star one and star one. Okay. So generally those calories is very entirely, as I said, it decreases the enzymatic activity. Now come to the genetic polymorphism. Genetic polymorphism, uh, you know, uh, when the, the, the prevalence of that particular uh, allele, the population more than one percentage, uh, that we call as a uh, polymorphism. Okay, and the, the most common is single nuclear polymorphism we already discussed, and the variant what we are uh, uh, going to discuss is uh, uh, two variants. One is C or two, star two, C two T. So any uh, before performing any form of genetic research, the basic thing is we need to see the prevalence of that uh, variant in the population. So uh, uh, so if you look into the different uh, population, this star two and star three, there are many variants. Are, uh, uh, many variants have been. Uh, uh, reported more than 50 variants have been reported here, but why star 2 and star 3 importance are because of the uh, warped interethnic uh, variation in the frequency. Okay, if you look at the star 2, you can see that in the Chinese and Japanese, the white rural population, uh, this was not been reported, whereas in Caucasian, it is reported the maximum. Whereas in South Indians, when we uh, conducted the, our study, we found 4 percentage. So if you look how to fit this population, you can see that this is uh, 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 genetically unique, and you can see that it may be either fit into the Oriental or to the Caucasians. Okay, so and at the, at the top of it, uh, the star three variant it is eight percent in this population. So totally twelve percentage of the variant that is prevalent in the uh, population. And moreover, there are uh, after this uh, uh, human genome project, there are a lot number of reports uh, uh, been uh, you know, so focusing on this 2C19 about its uh, toxicity and we've been studying the different population, Caucasians and uh, Japanese. So, but uh, the question is whether uh, this variant causes uh, toxicity in the Indian population because as I said, the ethnically we are different, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the way more important the studies which uh, uh, published, uh, you know, like a very important article is uh, the Leach article about the restructure of Indian population history, where they clearly said there are two distinct populations are present in the uh, uh, you know the uh, in Indian population. One is ancestors of North Indians who carry these uh, Aryans uh, uh, ethnicity. Another group is uh, ancestors of South Indians uh, that is. Uh, uh, who are basically belong to the Dravidian ethnicity. So these two groups are genetically uh, distinct group, and it's been reconfirmed by the Indian Genome Variation Consulting Group uh, by the IGIP groups. So, so meaning to say that uh, the selection of population uh, uh, is also is very much important. So we have conducted the study whether this is really this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the 2C9 variant uh, will cause uh, ferritoid and neurotoxicity in person with the epilepsy of South Indian uh, origin. So we collected 292 epileptic patients who are taking ferritoid therapy. And uh, this is a case control design. Those who develop toxicity, ferritoid toxicity are in the cases. And those who develop ferritoid toxicity are the uh, control. And uh, this is the definition of ferritoid toxicity. Those who uh, you know, develop the neurotoxicity like dizziness, dystagmus, ataxia, slurred speech, diplopia, lethargy, mental confusion. Again, we categorize into mild, moderate, uh, severe toxicity based on the, the, the presence of the uh, symptoms. And uh, uh, this, uh, we, we see to it these patients who recruited uh, from South Indian origin uh, for, uh, for up to the three, three previous uh, generations who were speaking, uh, uh, you know, the native uh, uh, language. Okay, and uh, uh, those who well, factors which we already discussed, those who have the liver and kidney dysfunction, and those who inhibit to see we excluded because this two cause to uh, to avoid the confounding uh, effect of this, we excluded from the study. And um, uh, the genotype uh, of this two C nine was uh, done with the help of PCR therapy technique and uh, with the help of this restriction enzymes. So the restriction enzymes uh, uh, give the pattern and. Uh, uh, based on that, we identified the genotypes of uh, 2C9. And uh, could, uh, so those having the star 1, star 1, that means the tested for star 2 and star uh, 3, and it is absent, then they carry the star 1 and star 1. And those having one copy, uh, uh, we are categorizing as intermediate enzymatic activity. And uh, those carrying the uh, you know, um, uh, variant allele in the both the copies because of more degrees in the enzyme. We categorize them. And also, we measure the drug levels uh, uh, of this patient uh, using the reverse phase HPLC method. 
and uh, uh, we calculate the odds ratio to know the, 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 the risk contributed by the each uh, genotype for the phenotype toxicity uh, by comparing with the, the wild type, that is star one, star one as a reference group, and later on we are adjusted for the logistic regression uh, for the confounding of the uh, uh, okay, so now we, uh, we can see that the patient characteristic well, 58 patients who developed the uh, phenotype toxicity and 234 uh, didn't the they are acting as a control. And uh, moreover, you can see that uh, this uh, the plasma phenotype level and those type of phenotype levels are higher, those with the phenotype uh, to uh, toxicity significantly differ from the, uh, from the control goal. Okay, so uh, now we, if, if you look into this, uh, the allele frequency. Uh, those without phenotype toxicity, you can see that the 95.58 percentage of uh, people uh, uh, percentage, you can see that uh, uh, you know they're carrying the star one allele. Star one allele is in, uh, generally is in a uh, functional allele. That is why uh, they they metabolize they, they metabolize uh, they metabolize the drug effectively and prevent the patient from developing phenotype toxicities. Whereas that the wild type allele was significantly decreased. On the other hand, you can see that the, the mutant allele uh, uh, percentage is uh, higher in the, uh, the those uh, uh, with phenotype toxicity, okay, uh, compared to 2.1 only in the, this one. So the higher prevalence is the responsible for uh, making the individual to susceptible to the phenotype toxicity. Right, and then, uh, when we uh, estimate the odds ratio for the each genotype, uh, comparing with the uh, wild type, uh, for star one star two genotype, there is four times risk for them to develop phenotype toxicities. Okay, whereas uh, star three, 13.8 times risk for developing the phenotype toxicity. After adjusting for the confounding uh, for BMA and dose and other genotype, uh, it is 23 uh, times, uh, so it's still higher. Uh, for developing uh, uh, toxicity. So meaning to say that uh, uh, among these uh, two genotypes, star one, uh, I mean, those carrying the star three has a higher risk for developing. Uh, and also in, uh, among these uh, different grades of toxicity, you can see that those are uh, severe toxicity. Uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, severe to moderate toxicity. More uh, people who are carrying this uh, uh, variant allele, uh, know they are susceptible to the toxicity. Right. So now let's go into the uh, mechanism that the DPH, nothing but the diphenylhydrotoin or the phenytoin. Okay, it comes to the metabolism to the liver. Uh, no, it comes to the uh, liver for metabolism. Where two C9 genes are there, it is hydroxylate uh, the uh, the no phenytoin and converted into 5 hydroxy phenylhydrotoin. Is uh, I, I said before, it is a uh, water soluble carbon. It is easily uh, excreted from the kidney, so the the, the, the parent drug will not accumulate inside. Okay, that by the patient will not develop because of the functionality of the star one star one. Okay, on the other hand, those carry the you know heterozygous uh, uh, genotype. Okay, there is, uh, you can see that it is not effectively binding to this uh, uh, enzyme because there is a uh, variant allele. Variant allele cause the, you know, missense mutations, so the, 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 the substrate binding is not very much effective. At the same time, since there is one copy is normal, there is a partial hydroxylation is taken place. Okay, uh, and the, this uh, clearance is slightly decreased. Okay, and on the on the, on the top uh, on the uh, the uh, those patients who carry the both the copies the variant allele, uh, okay, you can see that uh, it's not able to bind to the substrate that is the enzyme properly, okay, because of this uh, the missense mutation the protein folding change in the substrate binding site. So as a result, um, the parent track accumulation the phenytoin uh, uh, DPH or phenyl uh, PhD the, uh, the the it start accumulating inside. Okay, as a result, the plasma phenotype levels are high. Okay, that attributes to the uh, toxicity. Those they are the neurotoxicity. They have uh, problems. So why why there is a difference between this star two and the star three? Because star three, a little uh, those carrying, they have they decrease the enzymatic activity to the extent of uh, ninety three percentage. Whereas star two decreases the uh, around twenty five to twenty nine percentage. So because of this. Uh, this effect, okay, because uh, star three uh, tends to be major uh, for this population, okay. So what we need to do is, uh, okay, we need to uh, uh, prescribe the, uh, before prescribing the individual for drug treatment. We need to test for this star three variant, 
And then in addition, we also do the routine investigations, not only genomic, in addition, we have to look at the albumin because we see the eye albumin we can cause, LFT, RFT, all should be uh, done to prevent the neurological toxicity. And, uh, and uh, the, the, this is one interesting case where uh, we have seen that a patient when given the normal dose, uh, she developed the, all, all the uh, important adverse effect uh, uh, taxi stack but on neurological toxicity. Uh, her genotype, uh, her genotype is start three, start three. Uh, one thing is that about uh, uh, why this uh, genotyping is most important. This is it relevant only to the phenotype. It's not so. As I said, it metabolizes several drugs. So this girl may develop side effect or adverse effect to the warfarin or other. Uh, we all know warfarin is an effect. So she may like uh, like to develop the uh, adverse effect this group of drugs. So it is important uh, that uh, genotyping will help uh, for the prevention of the other. Uh, uh, no other groups of uh, uh, drugs to uh, so that we need to note uh, here the importance of side effects. So what uh, what we have what what we have seen that there is phenotype uh, induced neurological toxicity. It is type of type A adverse drug reaction. Okay, and uh, here the, uh, many will develop uh, uh, based on uh, uh, the above factors. But the other type is that uh, you know the idiosyncratic that is type B reaction where uh, it may cause the cutaneous adverse reaction like STAS and uh, that is a type B reaction. So we quickly see about that uh, this cutaneous adverse drug reactions. Uh, okay, uh, 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 you can say in the form of SDAs or then uh, SDAs and toxic epidermal necrosis. And uh, they were, what they identified that uh, it's been seen those uh, patients treated with the anti FAP drug like uh, phenytoin and formazepine. Okay, they see that uh, the it's commonly seen in patients who are having this uh, the particular human lipocyte antigen allele that is HLA B star 1502. This is the first reported in 2004. So after that, uh, uh, those carrying this particular uh, HLA-B star 150, they are most susceptible to the, the factor uh, cutaneous or uh, serious uh, cutaneous adverse drug effect like SGS and 10. Okay. Now the thing is how it happens is that this here the, the, there is a uh, haptans. So the formation haptans is uh, important. The, the pro-haptans will have to convert it to the active haptans. And whenever you give the drugs like phenytoin or chromosomine, okay, it covalently bind to the haptans, okay, and as a result, uh, this complex will, uh, you know, is be caused by the antigen presenting cells. Here, the keratinocyte is the antigen pre uh, presenting cells, okay. When this complex and those carrying this actually be uh, so especially those carrying this particular uh, this variant uh, actually be uh, star one five zero two. And uh, you know that uh, what happened, this complex initiates the T cell activation and comes and binds with the T, uh, T cell receptor and activates. And uh, once it activates, what happened, there is a series of uh, inflammatory uh, success of release from these T cells and thereby it attacking the cell. So you can understand better with this uh, picture. Okay, assuming that uh, uh, you know the patients who is carrying this HLA-B star 1502 and this is the drug, it could be carmosabine or phenytoin. Okay, uh, so uh, once this drug you administer, okay, uh, uh, after binding to haptons, it form a complex and uh, there is a, a set up about the, the antigen presenting cell. The antigen presenting cell is nothing but your keratinocyte, that is antigen presenting cells. And now it forms in a complex, and this complex uh, triggers this, uh, you know, um, attraction of uh, uh, attraction of this uh, uh, CD8 uh, CD uh, uh, cells which are present in the, uh, you know, the, the dermis. Okay, and uh, thereby you know that uh, this uh, CD8 uh, is a lot of uh, cytotoxic. It is a cyto T cell, so this is an it initiate the immune reaction by re releasing a lot of the, you know, um, uh, uh, aggressive. Uh, 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 mediators like uh, granulosine, uh, perforin. So these are the uh, mediators which is released and uh, uh, which in turn is attacking this antigen processing cell and it start to uh, cause the massive apoptosis it may cause. Okay, because of this apoptosis of the keratinocyte, you can see that the skin detachment is seen. Uh, uh, you know, that's caused the serious uh, uh, factor reaction. Most of the patient may likely to die. That's why the FDA uh, they issue a black box warning about uh, 
uh, this particular group of drug carbocibine or the phenytoin. Okay, they have to screen for this actually B5, one five zero two before prescribing this. Especially uh, those are uh, living in the Oriental groups, so the Chinese, Taiwan's. Uh, you know they are the most vulnerable population, so they are recommended uh, to screen this allele before giving this drug. Okay, and uh, as far as neurotoxicity, the uh, FDA has come with the uh, you know FDA is asking for the labeling changes because uh, after all this research, they have changed the labeling. It clearly mentions appear to be genetically determined by the two CNA uh, enzymes. So. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so as the evidence we gathered uh, from the different studies, uh, from the, from the different populations, okay, then uh, the, okay, the labeling changes happening and there is a guidelines of the recommendations coming from the, uh, the CP group. The CP group is a clinical pharmacogenomic implementation consortium where they say that uh, uh, how, uh, how they advise the a clinician to proceed uh, uh, for this uh, this group of uh, for the patient who are taking this phenytoin uh, or they ask him to screen for this uh, HLB one five zero two. Okay, if they are positive, okay, then uh, then, then, then they are saying that uh, uh, we should not use this drug either phenytoin or pharmacopine. Okay, but if it is HLB one five zero is negative, yes, it can save to start. But what they're recommending is a screen for 2C, uh, CYP 2C9 genotype. We've already seen that, okay? The AS95, the activity score, we already discussed about the activity score. Okay, the activity score, as it is decreased, okay, you can say 1.5 to 1 and uh, PM, over metabolism. So the over metabolism activity score is a nil. So if the for activity score is nil, the what they're prescribing is uh, uh, from the standard dose, you give only the 50 percentage of the dose. For example, if I am giving 300 milligram to the uh, patient, okay, what the CP recommend those carrying the poor metabolites, that is star three, star three, or star two, star three. So what they are recommending, uh, you know, 50 percent reduction. That means 150 milligram only you have to give uh, for them. Okay, or if they are uh, for the intermediate metabolizer, they are advising to uh, decrease the dose up to the 25 percentage. But if there is a normal metabolite, that is star one, star one, okay, so there is no need to change for do, uh, dose at all. So you can give as it is the, uh, you know, the recommend dose you can give. So the, so uh, what is the conclusion is that the screening of HLA 150 or so helps in preventing the phenotype pharmacy induced uh, uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome toxic epidermal necrosis. So, uh, so the, the, one of the challenge I present here about the phenotype uh, toxicity, okay, it is difficult to predict. That is the past now. Now the present is with the help of pharmacogenetic markers. Okay, what are the markers? HLAB uh, 1502 and uh, CYP2 star 3. If you will the genotype for this and we come to know uh, about the genotypes, thereby there is a possibility uh, for us to prevent uh, or we can predict that the, the patient will likely to develop the uh, phenotype toxicity or the cutaneous adverse drug reactions. So, okay, so the, in, the, in terms of clinical implication of pharmacogenomics, you can see that uh, there is a, a, a two groups has moved from the bench side to the back side, and uh, which resulted in changing the drug labeling and guidelines. We see the CP guidelines, we see the FDA guidelines. So, uh, so, so the other drugs are. Uh, slowly will uh, comes up with the uh, drug labeling and guidance changes. So, okay, this is my uh, conclusion slide. Okay, uh, we can, we can see that one customer uh, buy a uh, 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 call for her. And you can see, uh, as uh, all, we all know that we go to the uh, shopping, okay, there's a one size uh, fit all. That means uh, they, we, we all know our, what is our. Uh, you know, our, our cloth uh, size and uh, uh, medium or large or XL, uh, XSL, okay. So accordingly, we'll choose our size. Even though we, we even though it mention XL or uh, XSL, okay, what we generally we do, we won't buy, we don't build it directly. What we need to do, we all know that this case we are going for a trial room and we check whether, even though it is uh, their size, they are checking, uh, you know, in the trial room, Okay, and uh, and once it's everything fine, we go for the billing. And similarly, okay, uh, this uh, in terms of this, uh, uh, you know, the dress, you put the uh, the drug phenytoin. Suppose the phenytoin is there. Okay, now we are seeing that a lot of uh, change in the drug level uh, labeling as recommended by PA or CP. Okay, consider yourself. So you are you are the doctor. 
and the dress is the drug and this is the patient you want to pres uh, prescribe. So uh, before prescribing the drug like phenytoin or pharmacidine, this, we need to send them for triagram. The triagram here is a pharmacogenomic uh, uh, testing. Okay, so when you do this pharmacogenic testing and if there is a, a variant allele is present, okay, accordingly uh, we will decide whether to uh, go for that particular drug or not. So that, that's why this is very uh, important to prevent this, uh, the, uh, you know, the areas. Okay, and uh, this is the, you all know that the famous Hippocrates both, uh, premium non not ray that means first do no harm. And uh, if, if you know the tool that can prevent the harm, it is our duty to adapt it and prevent uh, the harm to the uh, patient. And this session, what we discussing is toward that direction. And the, with this, I come to the my conclusion time. It's my time to say thank you for everyone uh, for listening. And uh, if any queries, uh, uh, please let us know. We will uh, discuss in the, the, the next session. Uh, thank you once again, uh, especially to the uh, Professor Vedas Karya for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my findings. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye.